Okay, let's get this broadcast on the road. everybody we're back for a friday evening and we've got uh, pretty clear skies out there but notice the haze there's kind of a yellowish tinge to the entire video here and you're gonna see why as we go through some of the charts that's the big thing right there the other thing i think is a little bit of flow from north to south there some of that northerly flow coming in with a high pressure Music in the background. Let me see where that's coming from. Okay. Yeah, that's just the end of the music. So let's head into the current chart in the Middle East. And that's kind of interesting because look at those temperatures. Now we're looking at Iraq. Uh, cursor is missing. Let me bring that up real quick. I just put the computer through a restart earlier, let it do some Windows updates. And here we come. There's Iraq. And then we have the Persian Gulf down here. And then Saudi Arabia, Iran, and here is Syria. And you notice the absence of plots there due to the civil war going on in that region. And then we have Jordan right there. So right here in Iraq, 121 degrees and even 122 and that's not a feels like temperature that's directly observed in a sheltered thermometer and uh, that's pretty amazing especially when you go down to kuwait here look at that 118 over 55 so that's definitely not a dry heat and i've seen a few plots as close to uh, kind of in the ballpark of 120 over 60. I can't even imagine what the heat in index is like in an atmosphere like that. But uh, this is actually not a really a heat wave. These conditions have been gone, ongoing for about a week or two. It's uh, pretty typical. They do get into the 110s there. It's just uh, kind of hot in this part of the country, and this is the hot part of the year. Now, for the complete opposite, let's... Uh, Try taking a look at Antarctica. So we're plotting this in digital atmosphere. I'm going to have to redo this. And here it comes. Go back to the southern hemisphere. And we'll see what kind of readings we're getting down there. I think I screwed that up again. Okay, generate. Okay, yeah, that should take this time. So now we're looking at Antarctica, and we have some flexibility here with digital atmosphere, and I'll zoom that out just a little bit more, get the continental picture of what's happening. And then we'll put on the plots here. And this right here is the South Pole Station. Very warm right now at minus 65. But uh, tip, more typical temperatures, some of the polar ice cap stations here, well, this is the polar ice cap, but in this region you go to a higher elevation, 
about 11 to 12,000 feet, and we've got 96 and minus 101. I mean, that, that's just incredible cold there. Now let's head a little bit closer to home. And I don't need to generate a new map for that. I've already got one. And we're going to plot the current conditions. And there's where we see the cool air coming down from Oklahoma into Texas. We see the stagnant air mass over North Texas. And let's head into the other charts. So we've got a little bit of weather taking place in Pennsylvania. And these storms have a little bit of a bow echo appearance. If we zoom in on the cells, and let me sh give you a measurement here. From that mark to here, in fact, here, let me give you the uh, legend at the bottom. Okay, so from this cell, the top to the bottom, that's about 16 miles, which is pretty common for for this kind of bow echo storm when you get a line developing into bow echo segments they measure about on average about 15 to 25 miles there and that's a good sign that you have some wind in each of those cells and here's the radar so we always have to keep in mind where the radar is now one problem is at this range it's going to be very difficult to de detect ground wind because we're down, we're 73 miles away from the radar. So the antenna, as you can see right down here, or the beam is up at about six to 7,000 feet. So we're almost completely overshooting the cold pool. We might be able to use the storm relative, or I'm sorry, the base velocity anyway to get an idea of the winds in the storm and well, we can see about 35, 27. Doesn't look too bad. Because what I would expect to see on this side of the storm is the outbound velocities from the cells coupling with the storm motion. And that's not really happening too much. Now, again, keep in mind that we may be overshooting, overshooting the cold pool. So we have to really depend on those ground reports from spotters to really know for sure what's going on. And just click in one of the warnings here, severe thunderstorm warning, 60 mile hour wind gusts. So there's probably some good reason for that to be out right now. And then another line out near, out in western Pennsylvania here. And then a couple of cells on the southern end, south of Harrisburg. That's an isolated cell out by itself. So... When we see that, you can see the entire line right here. Let me get rid of some of these city names. Maybe I'll get rid of the roads too. Okay, so you can get an idea of the uh, line. And you can kind of see how the cell right here is just kind of a rogue cell out ahead of the line and has good access to all the moisture out in this area so there's an enhanced potential for severe weather with that cell and let's take a look at the motion see who's under the gun it's moving east northeast and you can see a little bit of a deviant motion these cells here are moving let's see here what are these doing yeah these are moving northeast and then this cell here a slight right mover going a little bit more towards the east there so i might be kind of concerned if i was like maybe right here in the path of this thing let's see what it's doing right now is that as close as we can get yeah that's i guess we could use the uh, sterling radar but uh that's only going to give us a little bit of an advantage there on range and velocities in that cell yeah, we are picking up a little bit of a mezzo. You can see the higher inbounds right there towards the radar and some weak outbounds. So let me set the storm motion and that'll help that stand out just a little bit. Yeah, 
That's probably about as good as we'll be able to do right there. So we're seeing about maybe 35 knots in. And about, uh, <clears throat> about 10 out. But this is out about 70 miles, and that's kind of past the limit of tornado detection. And also the bins are getting wider and wider as you get further away from the radar. So velocities that are kind of high become more significant as you get far away from the radar. So, you know, keep kind of keep that in mind there. Okay, let's move on so we don't get stuck in a rut here. I like to kind of keep things moving. Okay, I'll we'll have to back this all the way up. See, I deal with all these tabs up here at the top, and I've got a ton of them open. This is the reason why it kind of takes me a while to kind of flip between charts here. But there's Texas, and we can kind of see the unusual easterly gradient flow coming from the interior regions of the U.S. And there's that uh, low-pressure area up in Ontario. And somewhere in here is a cold front. And it looks like some very stout winds there coming across Lake Erie and Ontario. Okay, let me take a look at chat. And before I do that, I'm going to give you something interesting to look at. You know, this is a lot better than looking at a blank screen. Okay, got uh, quite a audience in here, about 20 people. David Holcomb, good to be here early. And David Moore, his wife is going to beat him. This is their anniversary, and here he is watching the webcast. Well, happy anniversary. Hopefully that'll help uh, a little bit there. And Ryan Toomey's... Hot and humid in South Florida. Dusty skies again. Heat index at 102. Homestead reporting 107 heat index. And NHC has posted developments in the Atlantic Ocean. Got uh, fun with tech here and SPC Richmond 1205 video game players. Justin Pulliam and Alexi and Eddie. Burl H. Sue M. Just got back from watching the film Dunkirk. And uh, Dunkirk, uh, to my recollection, that's the British exodus from uh, during World War II when the Nazis took over France and then they came back during D-Day. So, yeah, that does sound... I don't know if that's about the same topic, but that does have my attention there. Uh, we have Dave here, 130 degrees in Iran from Sue M. I wonder where that is. Uh, Carl Berghoff made it in tonight, and uh, Dave says temperature and dew point sounds like blood pressure, 120 over 60. Yeah. Which would I pick, 130 over minus 100? I'd say minus 100 because you can just keep piling on layers until you're warm. Uh, jumping flash, thank goodness it's Friday. Those pink clouds look like they're painted in the sky. Got Greg Kerner here, and lost my place here. Mike Estwick up slope storms backing in from the east in Denver. Negative tilt on the low in Ontario, if he recalls. Uh, David Burkhoff. David Holcomb thinks that cell, I think, uh, in Pennsylvania should be tornado warned. And, yes, uh, Dunkirk is the evacuation. Okay, I think I'm caught up on the chat. And I don't know if you were looking at this animation here, but it looks like a little bit of a hazy appearance. I don't know exactly where that's coming from, but I can definitely see it in Colorado. Maybe I can zoom in on a couple frames and really get a look at that. Because with the sun angle falling pretty low, haze really starts standing out, especially when you're looking in places like India and Bangladesh. And here, yeah, we can see it too. A very hazy look. And there's almost no detail of the terrain in here. We should be seeing 
irrigation fields and stuff like that. Because you know that stands out pretty well. Maybe not the individual fields, but you, you know you can see the river basins and stuff like that during the daytime. But here, lots of haze. So where where do you think that haze is coming from? Maybe I'll just run. The, let me just do a quick high split here. You know, kind of run this through again. Show you how to do that. Go to Noah high split. This will take just a just a second. And we just go to the uh, first choice there. I'm going to take a look at Colorado. So I'm going to run this high split trajectory model. And we're going to see where the air mass in Colorado came from. So here we are setting this up real quick. And I think we're going to run... We, we want to go back quite a ways, so maybe 84 hours. We'll do that. And... Airport, uh, K-A-K-O. That would be Akron, Colorado. Let me double check that. I don't want to accidentally run something else. I can just go to Digital Atmosphere and uh, round up a station like this. And go to Quality Control. And yeah, there's a KO right there. Okay, so we're going to look at Northeast Colorado. Click on Next. 18Z, that looks good. And the key thing we have to remember is to do the backward trajectory. That's really the main thing right there. And everything else looks good. We ran 84 hours back. But we have to get these heights correct. Uh, so we're going to set this. You can see that's above ground level. We're going to set that at 500, 2,000, and 4,000 meters. So it'll give us some different levels to look at. And then that's it. So you see how easy it is to get our trajectories and see where the air has come from for a specific region. And this should be about uh, done here. Yep, there it is. Got to wait uh, about 10 more seconds for it to bring up the map data. And here it comes. We'll just click on the uh, GIF there. Well, isn't that in, in, isn't that interesting? Looks like we got a trajectory there from British Columbia. Okay, so I really doubt it's this Kansas trajectory that's causing the smoky appearance. So that's that red right there. We can see on the chart down here at the bottom that that's a low-level trajectory. Now the uh, blue is the mid-level trajectory. We can see that the parcel kind of subsided a bit, then rose, maybe going over the mountains, and now it's subsiding again. Subsiding is kind of a drying, sinking type of motion. And the green definitely subsiding. So you can see that parcel sinking by almost two kilometers. So there's definite vertical motion there. And that's probably that parcel coming around that ridge there. So definitely trajectories from British Columbia now making it into Colorado. So that mystery is solved. We don't need Robert Stack in on that. Okay. We're... Yeah, let's get back to the main sequence, uh, take a look at the 500 millibar chart. This is the hemispheric chart, and this is showing us the red being height anomalies, positive height anomalies. In other words, a pressure or height higher than we would expect for this time of year. And then blue is lower than normal. And then just running this over the past five days... We can see that ridge building into the west, and then the growth of this negative pressure anomaly, height anomaly over the Great Lakes. And that's where we are right now. So that's showing us the low pressure area, the low height area over the Great Lakes. The vortex pretty much gone in the northern Canadian area, but definitely a whole lot of troughing. There's the 250 millibar chart. 
Well, it looks like we do have a little bit of a Hudson Bay vortex there, but the significant troughing there helping to bring in that northwesterly flow. And there's a look at that. The J, somebody asked about that yesterday. J is Jet, Jet Max. So the way the model comes up with that, it's got all of this stuff gridded like this. And at each of these points, it knows what the temperature, wind, moisture, and uh, X, Y wind component is. So what it's doing is when it solves this, it goes through these sequentially, and maybe it looks at this point, and it looks at all the points around it. And if all the points around it are lower in wind velocity than this point, it knows that that's a wind max. So it plots a J there. And uh, that's kind of how digital atmosphere works. So I'm actually telling you directly as the programmer how some of that stuff works. So 80 knot uh, jet max in there. And that's the polar front jet. And do we have a subtropical jet? Uh, I don't think we do. Maybe a weak 50 knot jet right there. But we're mostly dominated by the polar front jet. And there's the surface chart right there. I know it's kind of hard to read, but the way I usually do this, I'll look at the like uh, lower pressure patterns like that right there over the Great Lakes. That's the low. And sometimes I'll look at the numbers. 24, 24 Celsius, that's going to be in the low 70s. 20, and I'll just kind of look for anything unusual. And I can see that Alaska dominated by high pressure. This is kind of like a Gulf of Alaska high, so kind of cool maritime air. And then up in the northern Canadian area, not much going on. Just uh, very seasonably seasonal normals up in that region, about 40 degrees. Okay, there's the upper level trough, and we can see that that subtropical high has backed off into Mexico. So there it is right there, off of Gaimas, I think, out here in the Gulf of California. So if that was over Texas and Oklahoma, like we often see in early August, we would be looking at uh, some pretty warm temperatures because that would be associated with subsidence and sinking motion. Okay, there's one more look at that haze, and we know that that's from British Columbia. So I don't know if that is affecting Texas. Some of what we have here may be due to... I'm thinking, uh, could that be African dust? I don't think we have a deep enough trajectory for African dust. But I'm going to take a look because I, I really don't know the answer offhand. So I'm going to back this up. I'm going to pick uh, KACT for Waco. And yeah, just kind of run through these real quick. I'll let this run in the background so you don't have to sit here and wait for that. Okay, that looks good. And we'll let that run. Okay. So elsewhere, here's the water vapor imagery. And we can see a little bit of dry air coming down over Oklahoma. And let's see, anything else interesting? No, not really. Just kind of a very characteristic... Uh, Low pressure area over the Great Lakes. We can see a little bit of an S shape here, kind of a very big shape. So that's kind of associated with the very large medium scale wave over the northeast U.S. So big ridge out over the uh, New England area and a trough there over the Midwest. Okay, there's our thickness. 
and pressure. And I did something a little bit different. I used the 1000 through 850 millibar layer. So we're looking at a very narrow layer from about the surface up to 5,000 feet. So yeah, it looks like uh, maybe your front is showing up pretty well right there. There's three thickness lines. So I can probably place maybe kind of a stationary front right there. And then maybe an active front, something like that. And yeah, that connects all the way up to the Great Lakes. And looks like probably a new front coming down from Alberta. There it is right there, the start of an Alberta clipper there. And let's see how our reverse trajectory is doing. It's all done. Air mass from Texas is coming from... I need a drum roll switchboard here. It's coming from many different places. Low level trajectory coming from the Gulf. So it could be a little bit of African dust in there. The mid-level trajectory coming from the northern U.S. And then the upper-level trajectory, that's coming from Idaho. So I really don't know if that's uh, originating from the Gulf. Let me just go ahead and run a GFS real quick. This may not be too much, of a, too much interest for those of you in Indiana and Ohio and Pennsylvania, but... You know, I'm really kind of interested in what might be causing some of the um, dusty appearance to the sky here. I want to kind of get to the bottom of this. So I'm going to let that run. It's run. It's finished already. Okay. I guess we'll take a look then. That was very fast. Okay, there's our trajectories. Okay, yeah. It's a good thing I did that, because now you can see the mid-level trajectory coming from the wildfires there in British Columbia. Looks like it's coming from a very high altitude, though. But uh, I suspect maybe some of that smoke has made it up. Definitely no trajectories from the African coast. So now we know that uh, what's outside what's outside uh, let's see is that coming up yeah the dusty look that's going to be uh, British Columbia wildfire okay back to the charts finish this off here real quick There's all the smoke there in the northeast U.S. And then out in the Gulf, maybe just a couple of very small waves moving, moving through the flow right there. Then I'll take a look at NHC's advisory. 50% chance of cyclone formation right there off the African coast. And then we got another... System, very slight chance of formation, very deep in the Caribbean there. But at the moment, not much going on. So let's head into the forecast. We'll take a look at Texas and uh, look at the mesoscale pattern. So for tonight, uh, let's see what's going on. A little bit of thunderstorm activity there in far east Texas into Louisiana. And that'll obviously shut down by midnight. Very strongly diurnal. A little bit more activity in the Texas Panhandle, but it's going to be a quiet night. It does look like we have a southerly flow starting to set up. As you can see, we have cyclogenesis out in this area here and high pressure out in this area here. So that means kind of a south-southeast gradient. But there is going to be thunderstorms up in the Springfield area. Southeast Kansas, you can see that get started up around dawn. Bit of an MCS, probably moving towards Memphis or Paducah tomorrow.
Okay, we're going to look at the Canadian model because uh, the GFS run on Pivotal Weather is not going out very far for some reason. I guess they're having model problems. But you can see, let's see, uh, high pressure there. Looks like we got a cold front coming south. And then it'll come into Texas uh, later tonight. And then for our webcast tomorrow night, that front doesn't hang around for long. I mean, it is located right there around the Red River. But it, there's not much of a southward push because of the very strong cyclogenesis there in the high plains. So low pressure, pulling together that subtly gradient, and putting the brakes on that front as it comes south. And along the, that low pressure area, it's a little bit better of an Alberta clipper there. And that's being driven by high pressure in the Canadian prairies. And there's the cold air coming south. And this is kind of like the wind flow around this system here. Okay, then for tomorrow, let's run this forward. The system moves southeast. A little bit of an MCS in Missouri. Very wet forecast as it moves southeast. And then for Sunday, when we do the webcast, a little bit of filling of that low pressure area, but we can still see it over the boot hill of Missouri. And now the cold front behind that comes down into Texas. So the fronts are looking a little bit like that. Very slow moving, only moving up about a few hundred miles. Lots of rain along that cold front, so we're going to see precip chances go up at the start of next week here in Texas. For Monday, that front kind of sinks southward, and you can see the lack of cyclogenesis in the high plains. So with a lack of cyclogenesis, that's going to allow the front to continue moving southward especially driven by this high pressure area, 1020 millibar high. So that's pushing the air mass south. Lots of rain along that cold front. Then moving on into Tuesday. Looks like that cold front has probably cleared most of Texas. Big prevailing high across the Midwest. So northerly flow just about everywhere, kind of a mild... Uh, it's not so much cool days as it is uh, cool nights because we get kind of a dry air mass. It feels very uh, mild outside at nighttime. And then for Wednesday, you can see the high just kind of recedes out there into, onto the east coast. Front is still in the area and looks like some sort of uh, tropical system out in the Bay of Campeche way down to the south. And that's just one solution there with that Canadian run. So uh, there could be a much different solution as we get into late next week. So for Thursday, more high pressure, lots of cool air coming south. So it's a very mild pattern for August. And we get another Alberta clipper coming south. More rain for Missouri next weekend. It's almost a carbon copy there. And here comes a little hurricane coming in, out from the Atlantic. In fact, you, you, I know you guys can't see that. There, there it is. Moving northeast. And then we get to the end of the run. But uh, by the time we get up to the 14th, yeah, there's a system being driven by high pressure out in this region right there. Now, the eclipse weather should be coming into range of the GFS. We don't have the benefit of that on the Pivotal Weather site, so we'll have to go directly to NOAA. So we're going to go to mag.incept.noaa.gov. We'll click on the model guidance. Look at North America, the GFS. 
and the yeah we'll look at the thousand through 500 millibar thickness that'll give us a very good picture of what's going to be happening so let's see the 384 hour crystal ball panel yep that's starting to come into range 20th this is the day before the eclipse at 18z so what are we looking at high pressure over the great lakes Looks like uh, some cyclogenesis on the high plains. Very weak. Yeah, I would say weak cyclogenesis there. And looks like some cool Canadian air filtering southward. You can see the thickness gradient here in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So probably another cold front sinking southward. Maybe something like that right there. And the other thing that we see is a lot of rain. Very stagnant air mass across Tennessee and Kentucky. And I don't know how many of you saw my video from August 1st where I was talking about the problems there with Tennessee and Kentucky. One problem being that you have the Appalachians right there. When you have a very weak regime, like you see right here, it's easy for air masses to kind of get... Uh, stagnated and kind of hung up west of the uh, mountain range right there. So that's kind of what we're seeing. And I suspect that uh, if that pans out, there could be viewing problems. But again, this is 384 hours out, so I would not change my plans just yet. Looks like maybe a few problem areas in the Great Plains, but usually... You're always going to find some gaps. You can usually get around any MCSs that are in that area. So I think uh, things are looking pretty good for the west, basically west of the Mississippi. Track of the eclipse. I'll just draw that on real quick. And there we go. Now one pattern you can depend on this far out is the long wave pattern. And I guess we don't have a 300 millibar analysis. That's kind of weird. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. 200 millibars, that's going to be near the top of the trop troposphere. And that should smooth out most of the small scale waves. So the general long wave pattern that it shows, that should be somewhat reliable. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot could change, but we're looking at, uh, for example, the jet stream being pretty far north. So I think the likelihood of that being down on the plains is a little bit on the low side. The model is indicating a little bit of a split flow pattern here. However, it does look uh, fairly zonal. But there is some small-scale oscillations in there. So I guess uh, what I'm saying here is that it's kind of indeterminate at this point. I'm not seeing like a broad high covering over the western and central U.S. If I saw that, a pattern kind of like that, that would indicate to me, yeah, big long wave high over the western U.S. I would probably be looking at maybe good possibility of good viewing conditions. But here we've got a little bit more... Uh, pattern driven by small scale waves, medium scale waves, so I really don't know for sure at this point. Uh, it's kind of inconclusive, but I do think the jet is going to be probably up to the north in this kind of pattern, and that means that the surface patterns, like we saw just uh, earlier, those will be a little bit on the weak side down in the uh, U.S., down the, in the lower 48. Okay, let's see here. I think we're just about done. It's a lot of uh, discussion here in chat. I'm probably not going to be able to go over all this, so I'll just kind of skip through this. African dust, blame everything on dust. I wonder if the feed would freeze if Tim said Area 51 again. Yeah, that's right. We can't can't talk, be talking about Area 51 on here. 
Uh, David Holcomb says tornado warnings for Wilkinson County in central Georgia looks less significant in the cell that we saw earlier today. A little discussion there about aliens and African dust and the Russians. See, there's a lot of action in this chat here, so you definitely want to join in if uh, you're kind of new to this. Uh, David Moore got a run. He says good night. Yep, uh, David, we'll see you tomorrow. And the forecasting lab and simulator programs have helped my forecasting. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I'll throw in a plug for my website. I, don't, I really don't do this very often. But, uh, yeah, go to weathergraphics.com. And uh, this is actually my weather site. In fact, if you go to... Uh, I don't know where the link is, but if you go to slash Tim... Yeah, that's my web page, and you can see some of the papers and writings and stuff like that that I've put on here. And uh, Carl mentions Forecasting Lab and Simulator. That's going to be right here, software. And basically, these are just kind of like simulators that you use. You install it on your program or on your computer, and... You can uh, basically train with these charts, and it just helps you become a better forecaster. It runs simulations. It basically throws like uh, big chase days at you, and you don't know what day you're working with. So if you're working with like more 1999 or maybe the Fort Worth tornado of 2000 or whatever, 2012, you have no idea you're working with that. So it's a very good training tool. And, of course, the books. I've got a bunch of books here. Weather Analysis and Forecasting, the, probably the best one to start with. And then, of course, i got software, and I'm working on Digital Atmosphere this weekend. I'm working very hard. And I've got a Ukrainian forecaster or Ukrainian programmer that I've done work with several years ago, and he's very dependable, and he's helping to get some of the dual-pole stuff going in Digital Atmosphere. So that'll be pretty good to look forward to. And if you're registered already, you'll, you know, in the past four years, you'll get those updates free of charge. Okay, so that's probably about all I have there. And uh, I'll probably go ahead and just uh, close her out. So anyway, I appreciate you watching the uh, webcast, and hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. And we'll cover some more forecasting topics. Ryan says, great education and weather forecasting. Thank you very much, Ryan. And a little discussion there about books. Carl ordering four. Thank you very much. Especially as we get into this lean season, September and October. Uh, this is where I'm really counting every penny for the pills until we get to the run-up to Christmas. Anyway, thank you for watching the webcast, and we'll see you all tomorrow.